Let's just talk about the Federal Reserve in general, because I think a lot of people don't really think about what the Fed is and what, what its purpose. So I wanted to talk briefly about the Fed's history. So the Federal Reserve is the American Central Bank. Other countries have their versions of it. And its goal is to control the money supply and interest rates. It has two mandates, or it's supposed to have two mandates. Uh, those are price stability, okay? So that has to do with the inflationary rate when the inflation is supposed to be 2% right now. And the other one is full employment. But it also has a third unspoken mandate that I'll, get, I'll talk a little bit about it more, which is rising asset prices, or I, at least that, that would be my speculation that, that there's a third mandate that's out there. So the Fed, unlike all other government agencies, is not a public entity. It has a mix of private and, public and publicly owned uh, entities in there. And if you're trying to go into who really owns the Fed, you're gonna come up with a bunch of conspiracy theories and things like that. But at the end of the day, the Fed, the Fed is set up in a way that you have these board members that are, um, they're not elected, they're nominated for periods of 14 years. And the whole point of that or idea is that they are not influenced by the political whims of Washington and can set their own independent um, agenda. So the Fed was established in 1913. Before then, there were attempts at central bankings, but not really successful ones. Before then, the economy or money was predominantly tied with gold. And as there were booms and busts within the economy, there were a lot of panics that caused severe depressions throughout the 19th century. 1907, there was a really bad panic um, that ended up having the US government call up JP Morgan, the man himself, to come to Washington, write a check, and basically bail the US government out and install confidence in the financial markets. So you heard that right, the US government went to JP Morgan for a bailout, not the other way around. Boy, the times have really <laughs> changed, haven't they? So that all happened in 1907, and then they decided you know what, we need a better system to do this, to control the money supply, to add money when there's a time of panic and there's an erosion in, in the point of money. And that created, um, that basically ended up with the Federal Reserve being created all the way back in 1913. And um, we've had it ever since, and its influence has grown exponentially over the years. And I wanna go deeper into that. So, it may be interesting. Thank you for that. I, I can go a lot into the history of the Fed, but for the sake of time, you know, we can have that conversation later. And we'll be on for Q&A too. And uh, just uh, another question or another thing related to Q&A. As uh, Itai is doing his presentation, he's going to do little stops along the way. So we'll be able to ask uh, whatever questions that we have directly to him. So coming from uh, the Fed's website themselves, uh, the Fed is a self-funding mechanism, which is easy to do when you're also creating your own money. Um, if I was able to create my own money, I would also be wildly profitable. So the Fed invests in treasury securities, collects interest rates, um, and then basically funds itself. This is in red, the cost of expenses per year for the Fed in those given years. And here in white is the total amount of money made by the Federal Reserve. So the Fed is actually a highly profitable organization, but it's not doing it to make money. So it actually gives away that excess money to the US Treasury. Um, so that's kind of the weird mix of this public and private um, security. Now the Fed for being one of the most powerful organizations on planet Earth has never been audited. I'm just going to make that clear also. So this is a very unique organization that has an incredible amount of control over our lives. Let's go here into the actual slide. So what's going on today? What's going on today is we're in the midst of this coronavirus um, regime that's going on and we're spending a lot more than we're bringing in in revenue. Um, if you tune into last week's call, we talked about the budget and how we're bringing in about three and a half trillion dollars in revenues and how much more we're spending. And that was as of last year where we talked about it. So right now, between April and June 2020, 
there's $3 trillion of net new issuance of debt. So that means only in that period of time, we're borrowing $3 trillion more to cover all the expenses that we're having at a time where those, um, those incomes are declining. So this is the Guggenheim estimate of how much money the US government is borrowing per given year, how much treasuries are being issued. So 2006, seven, not very much, a little bit over a trillion after 08, 09, a little bit over a trillion post the Trump tax cuts to make up for that revenue. This year is expected to come in at over $5 trillion of new debt issued by the United States government. Again, we're bringing in three and a half trillion per year. Now you're starting to realize how unprecedented the situation really is. So, so Itai, I just want to make sure this is correct. As the federal government, we're collecting $3.5 trillion, $3 trillion. We are borrowing $5 trillion. So that means we have total expenditures of $8.5 trillion. Yeah, that's what I think the expectation or the consensus is to be. So where is the Fed coming into all this, right? The Fed is coming into all this because all this issuance of treasury is being bought by the Federal Reserve. So in the past, if you wanted to issue bonds or IOU notes, you would basically want um, investors to buy them. But this is no longer the case. The Fed is monetizing and buying those treasuries. As Powell called it last night in the interview, creating digital currency and then putting it into the market. And I'm going to let Gary later on speak more about how all this relates to trading with the balance sheet. So I'm not going, going to go into that at all. I'll talk about the more economic aspects of it. So the net issuance is going to explode. As we've seen, we're going to issue more than $5 trillion. So here in, in, in the red, um, you see over the years the total amount of issuance that the U.S. Treasury is issuing. And here in blue is how much the Fed is buying. And we saw that here was the so-called quantitative tightening and the Fed wasn't really buying treasuries as much. And now that is going to explode and the red line is going to explode. So as we've seen, the federal balance sheet today, the Federal Reserve balance sheet is $7 trillion, And we're going to issue $5 trillion in new issuance. So if we were here at seven trillion and we went from four to seven, the Fed actually needs to do two trillion of additional QE in order to absorb all that new government issuance. So what that means to me is that they're two trillion short and they're gonna be looking for excuses to do more QE. Do you think that's why he got on 60, 60 minutes yesterday? That is probably why I got on 60 minutes and it wouldn't even surprise me if they actually want a little bit of a down market in order for them to have an excuse to put more, because right now the treasury department is going to issue 2 trillion more than what current currently is going on with these QE programs. So this is, this is pretty unprecedented in history and um, unprecedented in the world. They're literally creating money out of thin air to, to, to monetize as much money as possible or needed or whatever it is these governments want to spend. Got it. So in Itai, we had one of the, the questions and we'll, we'll break real quick just for questions here. Um, it said, are we going to show their private buying? I'm almost taking that as the schedule of buying the bonds. Is that how you interpret that question? Is that what the question is? Uh, I don't know. Who, I mean, Rob, who... yeah, Rob said, are, they, are, are we going to show their private? Yes. Buying? Yes, we are. Yes. So you will see that. We'll show all of you today literally how to see the schedule of this date, how much the Fed is buying. And it's all publicly available information. Yeah, we'll, we'll show all that. So what I want to talk about here is this pretty crazy notion that the public, as we know it, is no longer buying bonds. You know, if you think about it, the, the bond maturities across all these 10, 20, 30 years is maybe 1%, if that, because of the, the supply and the way they're doing that. From the 2020 issuance, the Fed has already bought about 60% of what's out there, only le leaving 1.6 trillion to the public. In a place like Italy, right, they've issued 178 billion euros, where the ECB bought 186 billion. So they actually bought some from the public. 
just monetizing Italy's debt away, being like, yeah, Italy bonds at 0%. That's a great deal. Let's just buy it all. Um, same thing happening in Great Britain. Same thing is happening in Japan. Same thing happening across the world. Everybody is subscribing to this. Everybody is doing it. And nobody voted for it. This is just what they're doing. So why are they doing this? Where is this coming from? So it starts in, um, it starts in the 1970s with this theory called modern monetary theory or MMT. And I'll talk a little bit about how that all started. It started in the 1970s, a bunch of like fringe economics didn't have that much. Um, people thought it was crazy. And now it's the official doctrine of every central bank and government in the world. And I'm going to talk about it. So basically it says that sovereign countries like the US, Japan, Canada, UK, are not constrained by the revenues. So they're not constrained, but whatever it is you're bringing from tax dollars, because you have the ability to print as much as you need because you are the sole issuer of that currency. So if you print dollars and nobody else can print dollars, it doesn't matter how much money you're bringing in taxes because you can spend as much as you need in order to meet what you need to spend. And that is what modern monetary theory is which seems to be the new doctrine of every central bank. Um, okay. a, a few quick questions there. The first is, how does that impact countries like India and China? Are they part of that? So a lot of the ability to, to pull off the MMT is to have public confidence in your system and your currency, which China and India don't enjoy at the moment, but the West does. Got it. And my next question is, if it doesn't matter what our tax revenues are and we can just print, what is the purpose of taxes? <laughs> like well, for real? To, no, for, for real, it's to keep you, to keep you engaged, to make sure that, you know, you have some kind of, some kind of budget or things like that. Plus not, I guess not everybody is believing in MMT to that degree, but right now what's going on is probably the largest experiment with MMT ever conducted. So they're basically speculating the future of the entire economy in MMT's ability to work in the long run, which is obviously something that's never been done before. So just so people understand that that's, that's what's happening. They're saying that the entire notion of budget deficit is irrelevant. And all this is a hangover from the gold standard where money was fixed at a certain amount. And there's no real need to fix money at that certain amount. That makes sense. Any I, questions on any of this? I think we, uh, I think we scared them all off. Well, well I'm, I'm going to go back to Jeremy's question about uh, why, why we have taxes then. And you just said to engage, could you, could you explain that or answer that again? Yeah, so the MMT theory, some of it basically says that you need to feel like you're producing something for society and create that interactions, but it's not so much for the point that you actually need those dollars. I know it's a, it's a pretty crazy theory, but it seems to be a, you know, I, I wouldn't think that it would be printing and creating five, six trillion and monetizing debts to this amount if they didn't have an academic excuse to be able to do that. It, Itai, one of the, one of the questions, uh, or one of the comments, shall I say, was from, from, from Josh. And he said, it sounds like this works as long as the United States dollar is the global fiat currency. What happens if that changes? Yeah, actually, let's talk about that in the next slide. Um, so, is this trend going to accelerate? So this slide talks about the purchasing dollar of the USD starting in the establishment of the Federal Reserve. Um, this data goes to 2013, so it may not be as accurate. 1913 Federal Reserve is enacted. That's our starting point. In 2013, that same dollar is carrying five cents of purchasing power. How did we get there? Federal Reserve is established we still are on the gold standard. So that means the, the economy or the amount of money that's in the economy is tied up to the amount of gold that's allowed in the system. 
gold is expanding at a rate of two or three percent per year, maybe as far as mining and things like that. So that more or less coincides with certain growth of the economy and then the economy grows if that happens. Um, there's already some kind of dilution as it starts with maybe $10 being worth an ounce of gold. Then in the 1920s, they say $20 is worth an ounce of gold. If you have a $20 bill from the 1920s, you will notice that on the back of it, it says that you can exchange that for an ounce of gold. Then in 1933, after the bank runs and uh, the, Great Depre the Great Depression era, FDR comes in with an executive order, literally making it illegal to, to own gold and hold gold in your house. Um, basically, it's, I think it was up to five, five years in prison. You literally can't own gold at all. And you have to exchange that gold with paper dollars that you get. So all that gold ends up in Fort Knox, which makes Fort Knox very uh, famous, is because literally it was the largest gold confiscation in history. Um, what happens following in 1944, the winners of World War II meet up in a place called Brenton Woods. And they decide, because the biggest winner of the world was the US. The US was the biggest winner in World War II. So all the currencies in the world could be exchanged against the US dollar for a fixed exchange rate. And in exchange for that, the US dollar is going to be exchanged for a fixed amount of gold. So X dollars worth an ounce of gold, that could be exchanged at whatever rate with any other currency, but they're not allowed to fluctuate as much. They have a bandwidth, they're allowed to fluctuate it. And then the US obviously abuses that almost immediately where they issue more dollars than they have gold to back it out. And some countries in the 1960s pick up on that predominantly with Charles de Gaulle in France that said, here's all these paper dollars, can I get some gold? And eventually he picks up on the fact that um, there's no gold to, do, to, to give them and Fort Knox is starting to drain out. And then Nixon in 1971 says, you know what, we're not gonna do this gold thing anymore. And from now on, all currencies are fiat, meaning they're only backed by the good faith of the governments. And there's no more, um, there's no more backing of any gold at all. And from that point on, we go into this modern system where governments control the amount of money supply as they see fit. And that trend has just accelerated to the extreme that we're seeing today. So it starts out being very mild. We're only going to dwindle it down a little bit. And now $5 trillion is like a drop in the bucket. Easy. And um, yeah. Could you quickly explain um, how the value, maybe this value of the dollars changed over 100 years versus maybe the 100 years prior to 1913? Yeah, so before the establishment of the Federal Reserve, there were a lot of periods of inflation and deflation. Inflation was really limited. Um, you know, a house, for example, over 100 years would not rise in value much at all, if any. Um, there were really not, not that much inflation, like the inflation dependent system that we have today just didn't exist. Got it. And so just, a question, so just a quick question. Obviously, we're on this trend and you would just expect this to continue. When are we going to be at three cents on the dollar or two cents? I think we're already there. These, this is data from 2013. <laughs> All right. I think we're already there. So the thing that then everybody is saying, well, are, you know, with all this stuff is going to happen, how is, is this modern monetary theory, is it going to really lead to this inflation where people with the MMT theory, they said not necessarily, right? So the biggest question, or as I say, the trillion dollar question is, are we going to get that hyperinflation everybody talks about? And here is, by the way, M2. So M2 is just the straight amount of money that's out there in the system. Um, checking accounts, deposits, money market, like a broader definition of the money supply. You can really see here in coronavirus, um, they've really, they've re really let loose on that trend, like certain acceleration, and now it's just going vertical with the money supply. So the biggest question is, what's that going to do? And I think to answer that question, you have to actually look at the velocity of money. And real quick, before you switch to the other slides, I know a bunch of people here on the phones. When Itai is talking about the growth of the monetary supply, I mean, we're talking $3 trillion total dollars in the system 
around uh, 1990. And now we're up at 18 trillion total dollars in the system with a good around $3 trillion printed in just like the past few months. Right. So that kind of gives you a sense of how fast we're accelerating the amount of the quantity of money in the system. Which is totally unprecedented. This is almost unbelievable to even talk about that. But um, what's important to understand is that money is not something that just goes on its own. It has different ways of interacting with the economy. And I think one of the more interesting ways is velocity of money. So what is velocity of money? Velocity of money is the frequency of one unit of currency is used to purchase domestically produced goods and services. So basically think about it in a way of, I go to a restaurant and I spend $100. That $100 is, is, is earned by a server. That server goes to a mechanic to fix his flat tire. Um, the mechanic then gets some portion of that hundred dollars and goes and, you know, gets his, uh, his, uh, wife a present and the person in that store or business makes a little bit of money. Basically the idea here is how many times does that one unit of currency in this case, a hundred dollars turns around within the economy and understanding that matrix is very important because a healthy growing economy would have more transactions. Um, where a declining economy potentially will have less transactions, which is why one should, in theory, expect a tight correlation between the velocity of money and the stock market. So let's actually look at a chart of velocity. So this is the velocity of money going back to the 1960s. Uh, we have periods of expansion, periods of recession, peaked out around uh, 2000. And look at what's going on since the financial crisis. It's been in a consistent downward spiral and it's really accelerated into 2020. How could we explain that? So there's more money in the system and yet it is cycling through. It's slower and slower and grinding almost to a halt. So where is all the money going? Where is it going? So in the past, there was a correlation between the stock market and the velocity of money. Uh, you can't really see this because it's a logarithmic scale, but those ups and downs were reflected in the market in those years. Um, the big boom of the 90s all the way to 2000 were definitely felt with the velocity of money with things actually growing. Um, it even gave you a warning signal that things are slowing down versus uh, the stock market. Um, and then things totally changed after the, the crisis. After that crisis, velocity of money continued to go down where um, the stock market just went straight up. And the way I interpret that is that at the end of the day, the velocity of money or how, man, how much that unit of currency circulates in the economy is a factor of Main Street. Because if you have a lot of people on Main Street that are going out and buying stuff, and doing a lot of transactions, you're gonna have a higher velocity of money. And by the way, that's also related to the demographics, which we spoke about a few weeks ago, where you have less people in prime earning years buying stuff. But this to me is evidence that the majority of the money out there has gone to the rich and has gone to bigger banks and institutions because if you have a relatively wealthy family, there's only a finite amount of restaurants they can go out to or cars that they can buy. So they take that excess dollar that they end up getting access to, whether or not it's with low borrowing or higher earnings or whatever it is, and they go out and invest it into stocks, into real estate, into whatever it is, where if that money were to go to Main Street, we would have seen a higher level of inflation and we would have seen a lot stronger velocity of money um, it would have been reflected that way. So I looked at the data to, to show and to see whether or not it's going to, um, the stock market. So this is a really interesting chart and may help a few traders out there if they're trying to kind of figure this out. In the light blue, we see the rate of change in the S and P 500 year over year. So for example, 20% year would mean the market, rate of change from the prior year was 20% positive. 
here would be 10% negative. And here in the dark blue is the M2, what we talked about, the money supply over the treasury. So divide by the, the rate of the treasury uh, with the S&P market cap. So what's interesting is that in a broad way, the S&P was lagging that M2 ratio by 252 days on average, or roughly eight months, um, which basically tells you that a lot of that money that's injected ends up one way or another in the investment world. Um, I don't know if that's still this correlation is going to hold true, but if it does, um, market top roughly around 20th of May. Um, and then because coronavirus did hit the money supply in the form of, you know, just, just having this deflationary um, situation going on, may have a few months of potentially a drag, and then all that money was injected is going to hit us around 2021. So if you're looking at this and you're saying this is the, uh, you know, this is the S&P year over year and all that money's coming in and this is a, a lagging indicator, this looks like 2021 could be poised for one of the most unbelievable, unprecedented uh, rides up that we could possibly see. Yeah, definitely. And I wanted to look into the, um, into the kind of inequality in data in order to test my hypothesis and see whether or not that's the case, that velocity of money would be lower and the stock market would be higher if the richer would get a higher share of this new money. And that definitely seems to be the case. The money is not going into the middle and lower income. You can see this, this graph here starts 1983. In 1983, the middle income held 32% of the US wealth. And in 2016, they held 17% of the wealth. Uh, the lower income went from 7% in 83 to 4%, where the upper income went from 60% to 79% of the wealth. So that means that if the middle income gets a little bit of money, you'll see that in the velocity of money data because they're going to buy more stuff and there will be more transactions in the economy. But the upper income, there are less people. Those, those extra dollars are likely to find their way, their, their way into the investment world. Um, and we can see that too, that the average um, net worth of, of the household has not recovered to pre-recession levels, despite the stock market highs. So that's the way I interpret all that data. So yes, it's true. You can use that modern monetary theory and markets will recover. And I think the third mandate of the Fed is very important because they want rising stock markets because that's a way to get pension funds and endowments like the Illinois State Fund, the returns that they need in order for, for those promises to be, to be kept, but at what cost? And there's a lot of evidence that this type of QE just exaggerates the inequality, and it's a hidden tax on the middle class in a form of that currency devaluation. So that's my take on it. Cool. Uh, Ita, I've seen a lot of stuff going through the group chat. Um, can we open this up to, to questions? Yeah, absolutely. Great. Uh, Dave, I saw your question there. Uh, Dave Ritter, you want to you wanna share that out loud or you want me to take it? No, I'm happy to share it. So I, I, the, the question I had was around velocity uh, in, in the timing of the, the, you know, the, the velocity change and whether the impact of foreign institutions and government hoarding U.S. cash because it's a flight to safety uh, what, would be the, what would be the implications of that on an analysis that looks at the velocity of a dollar in, in more of a traditional Main Street setting? Right, because it does look at the velocity of M2, right. uh, which is the total amount of money supply. But I think that the amount that they're hoarding is not, is not necessarily going to be in pure M2. It's going to be in a form of treasuries or some kind of interest-bearing account, not in just pure M2. Fair enough. I just didn't know if you had a sense of, uh, you know, does that buffer it down 50% or is it, you know, is it just a drop in the bucket? I, I, I don't know. I was just, yeah. You know. I don't, I don't think it would matter because that specific data point that I take out is the velocity of M2 itself in the form of just actual money cash. Um, if they are hoarding cash, I don't, I think it will be in form of holding bonds, which normally that, that that's how foreign governments or institutions, they hold money in the form of short-term securities. Gotcha. Cool. Other questions, everybody? Mm 
Yeah, I just I had one for you, Ite, is didn't know about the early 80s and, and wealth to today. Uh, wasn't it also a fact, though, that back in the early 80s, it was like the less of the majority of people even owned any stocks, and now the majority of people have at least some stocks? Yeah, I mean, that that could play a part to it. Um, you, you mean in, in the... In the and how you look at uh, the, the net worth of the average household or? Yeah, because obviously if, if now the you know, majority of people have, you know, they, they have 401ks, they, they have pensions, you know, that, that type of stuff, a lot of it's invested, invested in the stock market. And if the market's going up, just because of leverage and wealth, I mean, the wealthy are just going to get wealthier if that's just kind of the mechanism everybody's attaching themselves onto. Right, but but you still have to realize that the vast majority of the of the wealth and stock market wealth and pension fu and and mutual funds and all that is still owned by the ten, by the by the top ten percent in a much higher degree than it ever was. So how long is it until there's no middle class? Good question. I, th I think that that goes along what I was just about to ask was, you know, compared to other countries like Britain, Europe, Asia, you know, I mean, what, what are, you know, how, how would we compare as far as middle class as, as opposed to some of those other countries? I'm not entirely sure. Uh, I would need to look at the data, but I do think that I've, I've seen a recent report uh, showing inequality similar to almost Russia or something like that. So it's not, it's not very favorable. Cool. Any other questions? So I've got a question. Um, I've always wondered what happens if the world dries up. I think there's a lot of foreign investment in U.S. debt, or there has been in the past. Based on your introduction today, it sort of doesn't seem like it matters because the Fed would just buy it or does buy it. Um, but what happens if there is, you know, as we get to a situation I was just wondering how this potentially has a really bad ending because it's, you know, it is a shell game. And as you get the negative interest rates at some point, you know, nobody other than the Fed is buying and that number just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And if there is potentially a loss of faith in the dollar because of that, that's one scenario that's a bad ending. At least I think it is. But what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, nobody knows how this is going to, this is going to potentially end. Because, by the way, that's a really, really good question. Um, they're hoping that we're going to grow our way out of it. That's kind of the idea in modern monetary theory. And we'll be able to grow and kind of keep balancing these things out so it doesn't matter at that point. But at the end of the day, if there's a total loss of confidence, in theory, they can just continue to buy this, the bonds to suppress it. But it could, it could lead to a to a real Main Street hyperinflation, and then they will be forced to raise interest rates. That is kind of like the, the, the potential end game of this. I don't know. I saw Goldman Sachs research today basically saying, where is this number? And they came up with $140 trillion. <laughs> They said, if the Fed buys everything, all commercial real estate, all stock market assets, all bonds, they're going to be at $140 trillion, which... I, I think it's 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 utterly crazy, but I never thought we would be doing what we're doing today. Yeah, thanks. Isn't Agreed. the end game always on these government type things that there's just hyperinflation at some point? I mean, that's what happened in the past in uh, you know Weimar Germany or you know Argentina or something like that. But they haven't exactly done this type of QE. And, you know, what, what we're doing now, Japan has done it in the 90s and ever since and how that worked, yeah. to a bigger and bigger degree. And they've just gone nowhere, um, but they haven't, you know, they've gone to external debt to GDP of what, what like 400 percent or something. And it's um, I mean, it's it, it, everything is just stuck. I just know that in some of the countries, I can't remember if it was like Cyprus or Malta to where they instead of doing a bailout, they did a, a bail in. And they went and just took money out of people's bank accounts that was over a certain amount. That happened in Cyprus, and that's because they're a tax they're a tax haven for a bunch of foreigners um, that had millions of euros in there, and they're a tiny country. So, um, 
that's that's probably why they did that. But right now, I mean, the ECB is doing that. You know, Japan is certainly doing that. Um, the U.S. is doing that. The only countries that are really not doing it, as, as Jeremy said at the beginning, is China and India. Okay, one more question. What, do you have any thoughts about the political implications of a change in the regimen or changing the White House? Um, you know, what, what that does here, especially if, if we start leaning much further left, where, um, you know, where I think people would, to Rob's point, I think people would, um, politicians would potentially, you know, want to, want to take from the rich and put a halt on this. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a really good point. I mean, for the, for the way that the, the, the governments act and the way that the Federal Reserve has acted, both on both, both political parties have abused the printing press and the ability to spend more than they bring in. The only nonpartisan thing that I can think of is spending more than you're bringing in. <laughs> Everybody was willing to do that happily. Um, but as you said, I mean, there has been uh, the way the way these things have kind of resolved in the past, there is some kind of revolution, some kind of tendency to so for socialism that that is that's certainly a possibility. Hey, hey, Itai, um, one of the questions that that came through here uh, was from Tom. And I kind of want to open this up to some of our, our, our Bitcoiners here because we have a few people who really know Bitcoin very well. Everything about this conversation is nearly verbatim, the argument that some people use as an argument for Bitcoin. Do you have any thoughts on this? So I want to turn this over specifically to uh, Tori Reese and Michael Flaxman, um, who are both on the call. Um, if either of you guys have any thoughts, I'd love for you to share. Thoughts on just everything overall or anything specific? No, just as, as, uh, as, as Bitcoin, like it's basically how, um, how, how basically the argument for why people are going into Bitcoin, like this just printing and printing and printing. This is a- Yeah. Well, I mean, it's pretty like the, the, the narrative is just absurd. Like in the sense that like, if you look at even the original, um, like the original white paper for Bitcoin and, and a lot of the, uh, the sentiment, like the New York Times headlines that were that were permanently ensconced in like the coin base of like the original block transactions of, of Bitcoin. You know, Satoshi was like basically looking at the path that it was on and he kind of like prophesized that that we would be where we are today, which is like in and of itself. It's like he's making a call that like it, it's like one of those sort of classic things that, you know, um, he was making a very, very public prediction and he was doing it in a very permanent and like public way uh because again it's an, Im an immutable blockchain that like you know there's no going back and, and messing with these predictions but but effectively you know he's sort of um the whole idea of of uh bitcoin is like to offer a deflationary alternative to what he saw as the unsustainable hyperinflating future of all sovereign currencies where he kind of felt that like any any country in its sort of last gasp to preserve the strength of its own currency would actually create its own demise by, you know, um, basically, pr you know, printing money without, um, without any constraints. And the belief is like, so the reason why, again, it was launched in 2008 was because that was the beginning of the QE programs that we were, or, you know, it was the birth of, of when really this all started. Uh, and so, he sort of put it into the world at the exact same time when this was taking place and saying like, once the, the, the seal is broken, we can predict that like this is going to reach a logical conclusion where, um, you know, it might start with a couple billion here, but soon it'll be a couple trillion there and a couple trillion there. And, and so debasing the currency was just what he saw as the inevitable future. And so he created a currency that couldn't be debased because it was dictated by code as opposed by humans and you know and politics so that's sort of like the bull the, ironically the bull case for bitcoin is that in a world where the dollar and other currencies hyperinflate uh bitcoin a, will will not will retain its value because um there's a fixed and deflating supply of bitcoin that is never going to change definitely definitely when the market when the market dropped on march 23rd i didn't look what was bitcoin's reaction price wise during like the week before week after and on march 23rd it was initially correlated, meaning they both dropped pretty precipitously. 
However, there's been a little bit of decoupling now where like the last few times where the market started dropping again, um, you know, the Bitcoin price has not coincided with that. And there were theories as to like why it happened the way that it did when the initial drop took place. But again, those are theories that no, it still can't be proven really that that Bitcoin is going to, you know, is going to move uh, counter to the market. Well, it's still susceptible to margin call and it's still considered right. a, a risk asset. So, and I there, mean, in order- and there were margin calls. Well, and, and- Ita, I would, I would disagree with you a little bit about considering it a risk asset. I mean, that's a difficult thing to measure in the mind of, of every investor, um, ex ante. But uh, when I look at the risk reward profile of something like Bitcoin versus the S&P 500, uh, both of them could, could very plausibly fall 50% this quarter. Uh, that is that is very much on the table, but only one of them uh, has the asymmetric upside. Um, S&P 500 cannot go up 500% this quarter. It is not possible. Uh, Bitcoin could. I'm not saying it will, um, but it, it would seem to me the risk would be to not have exposure to that upside. Um, so I, I disagree with that premise. A little bit. Well, the classic definition of a risk asset is simply an asset that can relatively have a large drawdown. So risk asset would be stocks, would be Bitcoin, would be even gold. The only thing that's considered what is the is, asset that, is, that doesn't have that. Uh, I mean, it would be research and found that Bitcoin had had multiple seventy percent drawdowns over its history in a lot of cryptocurrencies. So, right. Well, so, I would so, not compare Bitcoins to shit coins. I, I think that's an easy thing to do from the outside. But even uh, but even you, Bitcoins had seventy percent drawdowns. Multiple, yeah, that is true. It yeah. is definitely so, risky. So it's a it's a risk asset like the S. The only thing that's considered like a non-risk asset is a short-term U.S. Treasury or cash or whatever it is. But now we're talking about the fact that cash itself is a risk asset. That's kind of like the point of the call, right? And when, so, I mean, when, I think the key thing to know about about Bitcoin. Um, this won't convince anyone that they should or shouldn't buy it, but it is the fundamental thing to understand about Bitcoin is that it's the most scarce commodity in human history. Um, in fact, by some definition, it's the only uh, scarce commodity in human history because it has a finite supply. Um, gold increases on average, we discover about 2% more gold every year, mm -hmm. uh, but that's an average. If the price goes up, we have uh, an incentive to discover far more and humans are very ingenious and creative and will strip mine a whole mountain if need be, or maybe we'll be mining asteroids one day. Um, but Bitcoin has a schedule for issuance um, but even along that schedule, um, it is the most scarce commodity in human history. And so that is its its compelling function. If you think that's going to be valued, that's a, that's a separate question. Well, well, I do Michael, believe that's valuable, but that's different. One of the one of the main issues, and you know, we'll wrap it here because we have to yeah, we'll wrap to it the here next, to, to the next speaker, it. is one of the issues with the gold standard was that in periods where the economy was growing rapidly, um, the, 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 the problem was that there actually wasn't enough gold to accommodate it. So having something totally fixated and not being able to move and expand with the economy is also a problem. Yeah. Oh, I think it's a solution. I love it. <laughs> well, I, what we'll do is for people who want, after we're done with the guest speaker, we'll leave it open in the Q and A. Mike, if you want to hang on for a little bit, you can do that. Um, so I want to thank everybody for being patient so far. I want to introduce our guest speaker. Uh, he's a money manager who specializes in trading the Fed. Uh, so Gary is a CTA, a commodity trading advisor uh, with Cam Key, Cap uh, Cam Key Capital Management. Um, and he, uh, he also provides trading systems for, uh, for lease through trend finder trading systems. So he's, he's also uh, using systematic trading algorithms that he's developed. His background's in structural engineering, uh, but his passion is trading, and he's going to tell you all about that. Uh, he's been trading futures using fully automated systems since 2001. Uh, he lives in Scottsdale, Arizona, and when he's not working or uh, having time for family, he's probably playing golf or mountain biking. So, Gary, I want to say thank you for your patience, and I want to turn this over for you, and you need to, I can have a conversation uh, further into the Fed. Sure, sure. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. And um, I don't want to keep everyone too late, so I'll, I'll, I'll be brief. Um, but basically, here, I'll share, share my screen. Um, basically, I just want to cover two things. So we've had a really, really great discussion so far. Um, but I would just want to cover a couple things that relates all this to the, um, specifically to the stock market and specifically what we're seeing in today's market. Um, so you can see what's happened recently and what is likely to happen going forward. 
So, um, you know, the, I have two intentions. One's to show that clearly the Fed has an impact on the stock market. And I want to show you how you can use that going forward. So first, um, we've covered a lot about the Fed, but I want to show a graphic to show the Fed's major operations in, since the financial crisis. And that's when they really kicked in with their quantitative easing programs. So we've talked about a little bit, but basically quantitative easing is when the, a bank, they go in, they buy bonds or other financial assets, and this injects money into the economy. It's the way, it's, it's the way that they provide liquidity. And this all started, um, at least for the US, uh, in 2008, when we had the financial crisis, they started, uh, started quantitative easing. And that liquidity, liquidity that they pumped it into the market really had a bullish effect on the stock market. And then for whatever reason, they stopped this quantitative easing in uh, the first quarter of 2010, and the market went sideways and got a lot more volatile. Then they had a second round of quantitative easing. The market went back up in a bullish fashion. And then they stopped quantitative easing, the market went down. Then they did one that they called Operation Twist, which I think at this time, they actually had a concern about increasing their balance sheet too much. Um, that's clearly not a concern these days, but back then they wanted to be accommodative to the market, but not necessarily you know, just uh, print money nonstop. So they did what they called Operation Twist and they sold short-term treasuries and bought long-term. So this really held interest rates down to, you know, help incre increase um, residential spending, you know, buying houses, buying apartments, um, businesses investing for the long term. It really, it, it kind of, it was a, a comedy in that way, and it had a bullish impact on the market. Well, apparently that wasn't enough. So then they started the third round of quantitative, quantitative easing being in 2013. And you can see that the market just, you know, really, really ripped higher. Then in 2014, they started tapering those purchases. And then in July of 2014, right here, they said that they were going to end quantitative easing and the market really did not like that. So then when they stopped this quantitative easing, you can see for many years, um, the market mostly went sideways and, and with a lot more volatility. Then Trump was elected president and people were, got excited, at least investors did, um, because there was likely going to be tax cuts coming, more favorable policy for businesses, et cetera. And that started ramping up the stock market. And that gave the Fed a chance now to start reducing the balance sheet. So, and starting in late 2017, they went through a process called quantitative tightening, where they actually started reducing their balance sheet. They started taking liquidity out of the market. And this is all just based on the open arc market operations, not necessarily what the treasury is doing. Well, I'll cover that a little bit more later. But you can see when they started taking liquidity out of the market, the market went crazy. The, the bullishness, you know, the straight up bull market came to an end. We had a lot more volatile moves, both up and down. And it, it you know, all that bullishness went away. Then we had, uh, starting last August, uh, we had what uh, Powell called not QE, although, what they're doing is the exact same thing they did in all the previous rounds of uh, quantitative easing. And that's where they're going into the market and uh, buying bonds and other financial assets. Then COVID hit, stock market tanked. And so they said, all right, well, so much for not QE, we're going QE unlimited now. And um, they've gone crazy and all that liquidity is probably, of course, it could be coincidence, but it was probably a major factor in why the market has bounced so hard from the bottom of, in March. And I'll show you a much closer look up at this, look at this in a couple of minutes. And, I, and, and, I, second th chart. and I think what even happened today is a perfect example, right? He goes on, you go, he goes on 60 minutes. He's, he, he tells everybody they were going to buy everything and markets have an absolutely insane day. You know, there's definitely some correlation here. Uh, yeah, in fact, here's, here's two quotes I took. I, I didn't want to cover the whole 60 Minutes interview because anyone can watch that and we'll provide the link. Yeah. But I loved his, the first answer to his question was, um, yes, I've been watching the markets. Um, and they have the tools to provide support. So I translated that as, we watch the markets to see how the real economy is doing and we'll provide support so that the markets don't fall. That's really, that's the Fed's put right there. Then another question. The only difference is that, that, that this, the stock market is no longer the real economy at all. 
No. You have you have twenty you have twenty percent unemployment, but the market goes up because the market the market goes up. I remember during the QE period, like 2012, 2013, every time there was like a bad employment number or something like that, the market shot up because everybody yes. is now saying bad, bad economic that figures. That's, me. that's phenomenal because that means the Fed's going to print more up, up, up. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And then now it's uh, really, I mean, he literally said it um, later in a, in a follow-up question. There really, there's really no limit to what we can do with the lending programs that we have. Um, in other words, they're never going to stop providing support to the markets because they're going to use their unlimited digital money press to do that. So that's the way I. So he's basically it. he's basically admitting that the Fed is uh, is supportive of modern monetary theory. Yeah, and in the past, the Fed has been really coy about that and never answered that question directly as as Powell has. Now I think they've given up on that. <laughs> so, how has it ch how has it changed that they used to have to print money and then now they do they really still have to even print money or do they just digit it so to speak? Yeah, he that's one of his. Um, he actually said that in the um, that was one of the questions in sixty in the sixty minutes interview. Um, Maybe we'll, I'll, I'll show that at the end because I just want to show a couple more things first, but make sure we cover that. Um, but, but basically it is, it's, it's digital now. They just print digital money all they want. There is no limit. They, they not, they're not bound by anyone by limiting the amount of money they can provide to the system. I'd love access to that keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Give me my wire instructions when you get access like that, okay? <laughs> Um, well, here's, here's another view, um, and this is what they, uh, is the, what the Fed's SOMA, which is their system, it's their open market account. This is, this is the account balance of what they actually go out in the open market and buy. This isn't then, you know, all the other stuff that they might do with other banks, et cetera. This isn't the, necessarily directly the money supply. This is what they're literally going out in the market and buying treasuries with. And, and, and mortgage-backed securities, and now commercial mortgage-backed securities. So just real quickly, um, you can see back in the 2003, this is when they start sh sharing this data, 2003 to 2007, they were adding a little bit of money, but it wasn't any big deal, the market was going up. And for whatever reason, in 2007, they, started, they decided to start reducing their balance sheet and taking some liquidity out. Maybe they were concerned about the housing bubble. Well, they really helped that bubble burst and the market went down quite a bit. I don't know why they, I mean, they actually went down below to where they were way back in 2003. So I'm not sure why they did that, but it, it had a clear effect on the economy and might've been part of the reason we had the financial crisis, I had a crisis, I don't know. But anyway, they clearly saw that, that was having a hard impact in the market too much. So they didn't do anything for most of 2008. And then in late 2008, they started quantitative easing. So you can see now their balance sheet, this is how much the, the total balance of liquidity they're adding to the system. And it really helped prop up the market. And you can see when they didn't do much, the market went sideways. When they added money, it popped up the market. When they didn't do anything, it, nothing really happened. So this is QE1, QE2, Operation Twist. Here's QE3 coming up here, where it up, uh, moved up the market. And then here's those few years where they didn't do anything. And then when they start tapering, the market goes crazy and, and kind of loses its bullish steam. And then now, um, it's, it's kind of interesting that they started pumping up while the market was going up at the same time, but they did. And now you can see just how much it's jumped up, you know, two trillion just in the past two months, just from the open market. That's not including the other uh, currency and everything else that they're flooding the market with. So now let's go even closer and here's, specifically from August uh, 2019 to today. So what they started doing in August was they literally, um, I'll just go ahead and show this to you. They literally started saying, okay, I'll go back to August 2014, we're gonna start purchasing about $20 billion of treasury securities for the next month. And so, and they started doing this over and over again. And then recently, they, since they've been pumping so much, they're actually uh, providing this data every single week. So now you can uh, open this and see like today, they bought $2 billion worth of treasury coupons, one and a half billion tips. Tomorrow they're gonna buy nine and a half billion treasury coupons, et cetera. So they've gotten to the point now that they're, they're buying billions of coupons, mortgage-backed 
this this doesn't even include the mortgage backed securities. This is just literally treasuries every single day. So and to go back to that chart now, that's where I'm showing this data. And one so every one of these bars is is the what they're buying that day. So you can see what you know as as uh, you know as they were increasing their balance sheet, market went up, then COVID hit, and so to, they started bump you know pumping in. It started. It was like twenty billion, thirty billion. Now, now every single one of these bars is seventy-five billion dollars every single day. And so, that's only that's only in treasuries, but I, I think it was like treasuries. I think it was like three hundred billion in total because they pumped a lot into the uh, the lending market because they were afraid yeah. that's going to freeze up. Yeah. So yeah. So that's so you can't tell me that it's a coincidence that the stock market goes down. And they put all this money in the market. I mean, they you know they're clearly wanting to support the stock market. And now that once the mark, stock market bounced back, they started reducing all of this pumping of money that they're putting into the market. So um, I think we all kind of know that the Fed has an impact on the market, but I think these graphs might help make it clearer for you. Um, so now I want to show you, if you want to use this information going forward, um, I want to show you how you could do that. So for their system open market account, every single Thursday afternoon, and we'll we'll give you all these links if you don't have them all, if you didn't receive them already. So every single Thursday afternoon, they go in and um, update their current balance of all of the treasures they have as of the previous Wednesday. So when you use this data, you do need to be careful that you're not looking, you know, you know, having a look ahead bias when you're using the data. You kind of keep got to keep that in mind. But anyway, what if you want to download this data, you can scroll down to the bottom. And there's a data export. So if you go to the uh, quarterly detail, et cetera, you can go to the weekly summary and you can sit, you can download the uh, spreadsheet right there. And this is the data that you get. So, you know, you have starting back in 2003 all the way to current and they'll show the balance of the total mortgage backed securities, their tips, et cetera. So if we go down to what it looks like nowadays, or at least the past couple of months, um, like, you know, they were 4 billion, let's see. Yeah, they started right here in the middle of uh, March going crazy. They were basically at 4 billion. Now it's at 5.8 billion and it's going up, you know, depends on the week, but somewhere, some weeks are 70 billion, some weeks are 200 billion. It's, it's just going up like crazy. And starting in April, not only were they um, buying mortgage-backed securities, they've also started buying commercial mortgage-backed securities. So they're supporting the commercial market as well, not just the residential market. So you can go to that website, download this, and it's all right there for you. Great, and we'll send out the links uh, to all of this along with the video afterwards. So for all of you that- really I know it's a lot of information, so. Yeah, and then, right. And then and then if you want to, every week, if you want to see what their um, treasury operations are, uh, which with this one, which is nice, it's actually looking forward. It's not just looking back. Um, but you go each one of these and um, every Friday afternoon, they, they update this for the next week. It changes over time. It used to be once a month. Now it's every single week. So that's how we got um, this PDF here that shows what they're going to be doing for that week. Um, I don't know, I kind of went through a bunch of information there and I'm, there, I don't know if there were other questions or if we, what, how you want to continue the discussion from here. I would say let's open it up to uh, Q&A from everybody uh, in the audience. Uh, that's really you know, where we're at right now. Uh, one, of, one of the things I was hearing about for months was this overnight lending and how that was getting concerning. And where does this stuff you're looking at fall into that? Because there were some concerning things in the amount of money that the, I guess the Fed was having to pump into the banks on overnight lending. Um, I personally don't look at that much because it's not an, it's not, because I'm a trader, so I'm interested in what happens with the stock market. So the way I viewed that information, um, it didn't really impact me. So I don't look at it too much. I don't know if Itai can, Itai can add something to that. Yeah, I mean, uh, that was when the non-QE period was going yeah. on, literally because of that reason. There was, uh, there was a dollar shortage with all the dollars were printing. There was still a dollar shortage uh, <laughs> with foreign banks, and they were trying to ease the, that repo market. 
and then coronavirus hit and we had that 12 trillion dollar margin call which tanked global markets so um the roots for that were already were already um were already in there i find it interesting though that knowing what the treasury issuance for the year is at roughly five trillion dollars and where the balance sheet sheet is as well we kind of have an idea of how much more qe needs to take place so I feel they're tapering it and maybe they want the market to dip a little bit so they can do some QE again. Uh, that would yeah. be my take. Yeah, I don't, yeah, they don't want to create too much of a bubble. They want to add it when it's needed, you know, cause you know, they can, it's there. So it, it is, it's kind of tricky because, you know, you do have COVID and we don't really know what's going to happen. Uh, the only thing we do have a really good idea about is that the Fed is going to do everything they can to keep things going up as much as they can. So that, that brings that third mandate we talked about at the beginning of the conversation, which is the two official mandates is price stability and full, full employment. But the third mandate is a consistently rising stock market because so many pensions, endowments, and returns, and, and 401ks depend on that. Yeah, and it really actually supports both mandates because it supports price stability if, if asset prices are rising and it, and it supports employment if asset prices are rising and companies are doing well. So that's, you know, the rationalization does impact the other mandates. Now, how, 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 now for how long can they actually do this? That's the trillion or at this point, $140 trillion question. Yeah. Till they buy everything out there. I mean, isn't the simple answer is what is the appetite of uh, U.S. bonds in the marketplace? Uh, that's the simple answer, right? Uh, probably a very complicated way of figuring the answer to that. But if if the world doesn't buy U.S. bonds anymore, then the Fed cannot print any more currency. That's not that's not true because the uh, the answer to that is as shown in the beginning chart is that the Fed is buying all the treasuries the U.S. is issuing, not anybody else. Oh, I see. Okay, that's all them buying bonds right here. Yeah, they yeah. are literally literally the U.S. got the U.S. Treasury prints, the Fed buys. There's no more investors because believe it or not, the appetite to buying a thirty-year Treasury at one percent is not as high as you think. <laughs> but, on, but on the balance sheet, uh, on the balance sheet, that debt gets added onto the U.S. balance sheet, right? It, yes, it does. Okay. That's, that's the crazy part of it, because if you realize from the four some trillion dollars of issuance already done this year, the Fed itself bought more than 60% of them. Okay. So at what point, you know, like, can it buy 100% of them? Probably not. So, that's what they're. That's what they're doing in both the EC, the Euro European right. Central Bank, but, and but, in Japan. So they are. But, they are actually yeah. doing it. But but at a, at a at a certain point, if we're printing money to buy seventy percent or eighty percent of the bond issuance, then something's going to go awry because yeah. there's not enough. There there's not enough external demand for our bonds, and that might be where the inflation happens. Is because if not, if there's not enough demand, then there's literally not enough demand for dollars either yeah i mean i mean so far i don't know if that's the case because we're seeing literally the ecb buying a hundred percent of all the bonds out there in the european union and the euro is not collapsing mm. why right the yen is not collapsing japan's doing the same thing so i don't necessarily think that that's going to um I don't necessarily think that's going to stop them. And the truth is that none of us know how this is going to end exactly because it's just never been done before. Yeah, it's just that every, in, in, in every engineering kind of model, there's always a stress point, right? When it just can't hold the load anymore. And it would be helpful to understand what that point is. I'm not saying the U.S. is a uh, engineering structure, engineered structure, but... In economics, the the it, it does apply a little bit. Um, so, like for example, like how much debt can we actually sustain, right? Well, traditionally we're at like six or eight percent of our 
uh, of our servicing is paying off the debt, right? Or the yearly, you know, financing necessary to pay off the debt. We're at about 11% now. Um, at what point does it get unsustainable? At 16%, you know, uh, we're, we're kind of at historic highs. Uh, we, we, we still have a little bit left in the tank. Um, and then that's clearly defined by, you know, if the economy nose dives and our ability to, th th then our revenues go down and our actual, uh, the amount we have to pay, you know, to sustain our debt goes up because our revenue goes down, it becomes a bigger percentage of our budget. So it, it's well, just, yeah. Which is why, which is why you, you know, which is why you see places in Europe going to negative interest rates because if you're mm -hmm. buying a, if you're buying a negative rate bond, you can borrow as much as you want because mm -hmm. if your central bank buys it, not only did they pay money to buy it, but they pay the, they pay interest to the treasury. So imagine in mm -hmm. this crazy world of negative interest rates, let's say the U S government issued a negative 1% treasury. The mm -hmm. Fed would buy it and pay money to do it. So the U S can go ahead and spend whatever they want on that treasury. And then the government would receive interest from the Fed for that negative bearing bond that they also print. That's coming next. Did, did y'all see the tweet from Trump on this uh, on May 12th uh, last week? He said, as long as other countries are receiving the benefits of negative rates, the USA should also accept the gift, all, all caps, big numbers. I assume that's, he means big negative interest rates. <laughs> yeah, I we're talking betting on for a long time. So I'm I think this. that's that's definitely coming. Uh, it's happening anywhere else. I think that's that's a black hole, like for growth and all that stuff. It's just, I mean, just just think about the fact that if now if you're holding cash in a savings account, you're getting a negative rate on it. You're basically they're taking money away from the from what you're, what you're holding in cash. And then, you know, it's, it's, it's madness. I mean, in Denmark and places like that, you get paid to take a 30 year mortgage. Today, my high yield, uh, like online HSBC savings account, uh, sent out an email saying they're dropping the rate to 1.3%, which is still, you know, very much in the positive, but that was 1.7% last week. That's incredible. I'll take 1.3%. Sign me up. That's, that's basically one of the highest ones you can get. But, you know, the FDIC caps out at 250K. So it's... Uh, so what that does, though, money. right. But what that does, though, is it disincentivizes you to put money away, you know, into a bank. And it incentivizes you to put it into an asset, um, like a stock or property. Not if that thing, you know, falls, if I'm afraid it's going to fall 30%. Right. You know, that's, so that you have to believe in it too, but maybe at the margin, um, I would well, think I'm, you'd be I'm more likely to buy gold. Aggregate world. Not, not in an individual world, but in an aggregate world. You have, to go, you have, people from an aggregate you just, you have to go out and buy a big mattress. <laughs> that's, that's actually been an issue in, uh, in Europe and Japan. They've had those issues where um, they've talked in the ECB about stopping the printing of right. the hundred euro bill. They stopped the 500 euro bill for those exact reasons. Right. People were just, we're just going to hoard a ton of cash. Literally, that's the, the whole move to digital cash. I think eventually they will just ban cash altogether. They were, there, won't, there won't be any cash in the world in, in 10 or 15 years. Yeah. Yeah, you can't hoard something digital. I guess you can on a USB or something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but it, in it, fact, it, you'll never uh, you'll never have Bitcoin prices go negative like we saw with oil. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, very easy to store. Very easy to store, right? I mean, Bitcoin bond, Bitcoin, Bitcoin bonds. Then, well, if you buy like CME futures for Bitcoin, the important thing to know is that you don't own Bitcoin; you own Bitcoin IOUs. And so you have to assess the credibility of that IOU for your time horizon. And it's probably good, but it's not Bitcoin. It's very different from, from the underlying asset. Um, because Bitcoin has this amazing feature that you can walk across a border with, with your life savings in your head. Um, but you can only do that if you actually own the Bitcoin. Um, if it's held in a third party institution, uh, you're getting price exposure to Bitcoin, but you don't actually have Bitcoin. So that may be plenty for your needs. Um, but Bitcoin is the world's best insurance policy. Uh, so to own it without having that is a trade-off.
Um, but if you want to take advantage of that insurance policy, you have to learn how it works and you could mess up and lose your money. Uh, so mm -hmm. there's all kinds of trade-offs. Bitcoin is a squirrely weird thing that is not like other things. Yeah. All right, you seem like the sponsor guy for Bitcoin. Yeah, I, I love Bitcoin, sure, but I you shouldn't buy call, Bitcoin unless you love it. Yeah, at a future call, we can definitely get a, a segment just for just for that. I, I learned I learned a long time ago that if I want to make money, I can't marry any specific investments, and I got to look at anything as an opportunity. But some people have a different time horizon. Um, they're not so much as uh, as traders. So you know anything goes. And I do kind of agree with the premise that you need to have sound monetary uh, responsibility to some point. I mean, the whole point we're presenting today is that we're in a mad world where none of us voted for it and there was no referendum or any question or whether or not we agree to it because I'm sure that if modern monetary theory was put to vote, nobody would vote for it. So it's just, we found our way here and nobody asked us. So what would have to change for us to be able to get out of that world where we did have a say? I think it starts with education. Most people have no idea what's going on and the Fed and all this stuff is just too complicated for them. They show little interest in it. And also, you know, they, they keep this stuff very complicated on purpose. <laughs> you, got a, you got a lot of lessons to teach to the younger generations. Now yeah. that they're home getting homeschooled, we need to get you on a, on, a, on a recorded Zoom call and teach them all ASAP. Oh, man. Right. <laughs> they're not, um, not going to understand. Right. <laughs> yeah. I want to open it up for any last questions real quick, because we've already held you a little bit longer than normal. Uh, any other last questions? Gary, uh, so you, you got kind of gave an overview you said you're a trader i don't know if you're a cta or you're managing a hedge fund so how do you particularly use this information on specific trades um basically as a uh bullish or bearish or neutral uh filter so i created a system back in the uh, beginning of 2012 called uh, fed swing and its whole purpose was to only trade in the direction of the fed and so basically it was, it's, a, and I still trade it now. It's, you know, evolved a little bit over the years, but um, back today it, it, it um, exited a trade in the S&P and the uh, Russell 2000 for some really nice profits because it had entered a week or two ago. Basically one, one simple way, at least the way this system works is when you have a pullback in the market and you have the Fed pumping liquidity in the market, then that's, then you go long. So you, it's, it's just a mean reversion type of system that goes in the direction of the Fed. And then when you have the Fed not adding liquidity or removing liquidity, then you only take short trades. And when the market goes rallies, then you go short and then exit once it comes back. So that's, that's the primary way I've been using it. Um, but then when kind of putting these charts together for this uh, short presentation, it, it has me now looking at, maybe looking at things a little bit more long-term as well. Um, and I just started doing that a little bit, um, but basically, um, let's see if it shows up. And you can't really see it. Um, you know, basically like maybe instead of just getting in and out of the market when there's a pullback, et cetera, maybe you just say, okay, you know what, for, for the foreseeable future, the Fed is going to be pumping money in maybe I could sell volatility, you know, maybe, uh, you know, buy the SDXY or do credit spreads on the S&P 500, that kind of stuff where you have a bullish bias, but it's not maybe a straight up long position. That's kind of where I'm leaning towards now. But, but previously, what was your kind of your time frame? Because you're talking about you get this Thursday report, where you put in the trade on like Friday, then getting on the next Thursday report, then readjusting or, or I mean, because you're getting this weekly information, right? And that's kind of how you're basing your stuff on. Right. There's two ways. Uh, I have another system um, called Simple Swing that was using that. Oops. That uses the um, that uses that weekly data. So I found that um, you, you know basically if the previous week the Soma account increased, then that's my bullish bias. And it's 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 another system that is a mean reversion type where so you know hey if the market pulls back and the SOMA account is going up, 
let's go long. And then when the market rallies, it'll exit. The Fed swing um, was looking specifically at back then, well, it's, it's similar to what they're posting now where every week they say how, what they're gonna be buying for the next few days. So with the Fed swing system, it just looks at, it's like, okay, let's look at the last three days. Did we have net buying over the last three days? If the answer is yes, and the market's had a pullback, then it goes long. So it uses the, basically the last three days of the current open market operations to decide mm -hmm. whether to long or short. Mm -hmm. And what's happened recently, um, we haven't had the pullbacks to, to enter. So, um, you know, the pe I think people are learning this more and more. So that's why I'm, I might be going forward. I might be leaning more towards holding positions a lot longer and just following the overall trend. Got it. But, but, but and, and vice versa, looking at, um, personally, I've been primarily day trading for the last couple of years because of the volatility in the market. And it's really hard to hold swing positions overnight. So I've personally been focused on day trading. So um, the Fed doesn't really impact day trade too much. But uh, on the short term or, you know, you could use it for on a short term biases, bias for a mean reversion system or use it for just the overall trend. Like, um, you know, like I was saying about selling volatility or just, you know, literally saying, okay, if, if the market is over the 200 moving average and the Fed's buying, then I'm gonna stay long until whenever. Yeah, Gary, I'm gonna interrupt you there real quick just cause I know we've gone a little bit past the time. I wanna let everybody know, um, we appreciate you all being on. Uh, I think one of the things we we're likely going to do is take next week off since it's a holiday. Uh, so all of you can enjoy and we'll come back the following week with some really good content. We're going to follow up with uh, everything that was presented later tonight. Uh, so that'll be a recording and some of the links that Gary sent. Uh, everybody is free to go now. Um, you're out of jail. Go have a great time. Um, and then for everybody else that uh, still wants to stay on, we normally just hang out and uh, kind of, you know, shoot the shit for five or 10 more minutes. Uh, so anybody that just wants to hang, you're free to. Everybody else, uh, that's the end. And we'll uh, see you guys in two weeks.